So how would you define media or information or multimedia literacy or digital media literacy? How would you define that for our students here who are between the ages of 18 to 20, 21, 22? Well, <clears throat> See, let's first consider traditional literacy being reading and writing. Um, first of all, we got to be aware is no one is uh, fully literate in the sense that there's always some type of traditional literacy you don't know. So if you don't know physics, you can't read a physics book. So the first thing is there's no such thing as just being literate. We're all literate in some ways and illiterate in others. And the same thing is true of digital media. Uh, uh, I could be very uh, literate in the sense of being able to engage in thinking about the design of a game, that is reading its design to advantage my play, right? That, that's what you have to do as a gamer. You've got to say, uh, how is this thing made? How does it work so I can leverage it for my goals? That's a type of reading. It's a type of consuming. Modding is a type of producing just as reading and writing are. So the first thing to say is nobody is digitally literate as a whole. Uh, we, we can have one or more. The other thing is to say that as with traditional literacy, there are high-valued forms of literacy and lower-valued forms of literacy. So take reading. Uh, critical reading is considered better than just passive reading, right? Mm -hmm. Just like in gameplay, thinking strategically and thinking about how the design can be used to afford you opportunities for your goals is a better form of play than just crunching the buttons, mm -hmm. uh, which is a form of passive play in a way, even though you're, you're punching stuff. Um, and also, writing is a higher value of literacy than reading because you have to produce meanings, which is much harder than simply consuming them. And that's the same with designing games or modding games. Or, so they work very similarly. And you know we can either in study then make all the same mistakes we did studying traditional literacy, or we could learn from one to the other. By the way, all of these literacies usually are combined, so of course it's, you can't even play Pokemon if you're not literate in traditional sense, right? You can't read. Um, and uh, so they're not, one does not exclude the other. Can you perhaps elaborate a bit on what 21st century skills are and how that dif differs from traditional education? Well, the word's used quite a bit for different things. When I use it, I mean things like uh, being digitally literate in something important, okay. uh, being able to innovate uh, and create, being able to produce and not just consume, and being able to collaborate, as well as being able to think about complex systems. Mm. That is complexity, which is just the hallmark of our world. For me, those are, uh, those are core skills. Uh, a lot of them involve thinking like a designer or being a designer, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to intervene in a complex system, you have to think about how is it designed or how does it work like a design system. You know, when humans and their environments interact, it, it, there's, a, there's properties in there. Just as if you're playing a game, you got to think about how do the rules here work so that I can leverage them for my own benefit. You, when you want to go study a complex system, you're going to say, how does this thing work? such that I have a leverage point in here to, you know, for example, see to it we don't destroy the earth through global warming. So those are 21st century skills. And why they're important is, A, they're not an offer in most schools, right? People get them at home or they get them in uh, a collaboration on websites with other people, like in modding communities. Uh, uh, but uh, very few people can get them in school. You can get them in richer schools, which you, the, the poor kids can't get them. And they're probably the skills that are most important if you're going to end up in a decent job, which, by the way, is very problematic because in a developed country, only about one-fifth of the jobs are decent jobs. Three-fifths are service jobs. And so right. um, it's a highly competitive, uh, highly competitive world. Uh, it's also the case that no matter how old you are, even if you're 60, uh, that you know, we live in a world in which you will have to learn entirely new things. And right. so you have to be good at learning. You have to think about every time you learn, how is this preparing me to learn better in the future? Do you think that, let's say, baby boomers um, are not as good at the younger generation, like my students here, at systems-based thinking, for one, or uh, and secondly, learning how to learn? What I learned from when I first started playing games is that they have a very different view of intelligence than baby boomers learn from school. I learned in school that an intelligent person is the person who is fastest and most efficient to their goals. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you took six weeks to learn algebra and I took six months, you're smarter than me. Mm -hmm. That's what we learned. 
Games will kill you if you bring that intelligence to them. They want you to explore everything, not just move forward quickly. They want you to rethink goals from time to time. They want you to think linearly and, and laterally, not just linearly. And uh, they want you to uh, be making hypotheses and testing them. And uh, it's a much better form of intelligence in a world of complexity. If you look, for example, at the policies that brought us into Iraq and Afghanistan, they're linear thinking people who don't rethink goals, who didn't test a bunch of hypotheses, who didn't think mm. laterally, who didn't collaborate, who thought their own knowledge was sufficient, but didn't sh to try to get knowledge from other sources. And so uh, I don't really think a good gamer could have brought us to Iraq, but <laughs> I do think baby boomers could do it, but they did it. This is really interesting for all you gamers out here because what he's basically saying is you're learning valuable skills when you're playing video games. The idea of yeah. the idea of of dying and then persevering through multiple deaths, right, is something that that Dr. G here is suggesting that maybe baby boomers don't understand as well, whereas you understand that better, and that's a sort of form of being iterative, of like right. being okay with little failures in an iterative process toward mastery. Right. right. A gamer sees failure as a form of learning, and they yeah. know that you have to persist past failure. And, uh, you know, again, baby boomers learned in school, if you're a failure or a bad person, you're mm -hmm. not as good as other people. Uh, but that's a disastrous attitude towards <laughs> failure. Uh, there's the, the core to learning uh, is that you have to put in thousands of hours of practice in anything you want to be good at. And you're not going to do that if you don't have a passion for it. So you have to get a passion. Mm -hmm. But then you have to be willing to fail and persist past failure because nobody does a thousand out ten thousand hours of practice and you know ramps up the difficulty and doesn't fail many 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 times. Uh, now you have a right to demand that when you fail you get feedback. Good boss battles tell you well you made some progress you'll make more next time you see some curve that you're making progress. It's frustrating fighting a boss when there's no information. You have no idea how close you were to killing him, right? I mean, <laughs> you were there 20 minutes, and did I get close or not? I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's frustrating, but uh, a good design says, hey, you know, you you got 20% there, and the next time you got 40% there. So, um, yeah, it's failure-based learning. Uh, engineering is a good example of a field in academics that is entirely based in failure-based learning. Mm -hmm. you, got, you better learn what doesn't work, and you better fail early and often and mm -hmm. fail in some setting where you don't kill other people because making that bridge and failing for real is a, is a disaster. The future of learning is not going to be just you sitting alone with a box or an adaptive piece of technology. It's also going to be collaborating to solve problems. Mm -hmm in groups where the group is smarter than the smartest person in the group. I mean, it, the type of five-man hunting party in World of Warcraft, which is what business people call, call a cross-functional team, that is, everybody has a deep skill. It's different from everybody else's, but they can pull them together to solve problems nobody can solve alone. That's going to be uh, essential to the future as well. And if you can't be on a, a, a cross-functional team or a World of Warcraft hunting party, you're the guy they're always throwing out of the dungeon. You're a big problem. There are a number of people such as Eli Pariser or um, Jaron Lanier who are talking about sort of negatives uh, of the new collaborative web and these sorts of things. For one, uh, there was an article, I think, in the New, York, the New York Times this weekend that was discussing how there are scientists who are trying to actually uh, make happen, actualize Isaac Asimov's idea of this sort of uh, psycho history or something like that, and they're mining all the data. They call it big data. They're mining yes. data to try to understand pattern, future patterns of human behavior. And yeah, that's the data mining stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, these technologies, look, in Halo, if you let the company take over the data of your computer, you could see data comparing how you played Halo with tens of thousands, if not millions of other people graft in many different ways. Um, and so, of course, once you get to 50 million people, you can make predictions about what people to do. You know, mm. the, if you buy enough books from Amazon, it's uncanny what they recommend to you. Yeah. No, I agree. With Netflix to some degree as well. The same thing. Although I share my account with my wife, so we have it's like a schizophrenic person that it's recommending to. <laughs> so, right, yeah. 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 But I mean, do you think there's any potential negatives of the data mining stuff? Like, I mean, I'm thinking yes. that 1984. Every one of these technologies, whether we're yeah. talking about ad ad adapting to you or data mining or the socialization on the web, can be used for evil or used yeah. for good or just used for nothing, just like books. There is no point asking whether they're good or bad. Mm. Uh, 
books have been used for limitless evil, and mm. people have killed in their name in the Quran or the Bible or the Turner's Diaries. Uh, and uh, so technologies are powerful. And so one of the troubles with adaptive technology is that it will adapt you so well you'll never really be challenged. Oh, right? You'll never find out how you would have done something that wasn't already customized for you. I don't want a world in which everything is customized to people. I think customization is great, but it can go too far. Social, you know, the way people socially organize on the web to learn, whether it's a Sims design site or a modding community for World of Warcraft or theory crafting for World of Warcraft, are, is often exemplary learning communities, which sometimes they're nasty as hell and they're mm. literate. Yeah. It's also possible we'll all live in a filter bubble. You'll only mm -hmm. see the news that you like. It'll all be customized. You'll only talk to people like you. Right. And we'll live in our bubbles. Or we'll all get into communities where, where, where we're talking to people we could never have met and we'll do much better. So um, it, the, it's the, the, all of the social media stuff, all of the digital technology has a dark side and mm. a bright side. Mm -hmm. And then a nothing side, we'd like with television, you can waste your time watching it. See, so if you watch television without thinking about it, without relating it to anything, probably doesn't do your neighbor any damage, but it certainly isn't doing you any good unless it's relaxing you. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you can't do great things with television. It doesn't mean you can't do evil with it. So, yeah, I, I don't like people who romanticize the technologies, mm -hmm. but I also don't like people who then just only harp on the bad.